Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Bert Dicht. I am the Managing Director of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our Space Forum this evening. From Earth to Orbit to Industry, an astronaut's journey, a conversation with Captain Scott Scooter Altman, United States Navy retired. So we're looking for a real fun discussion tonight. As always, I just want to thank you for joining our Space Forum. We really appreciate taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to take part in these Space Forums and Town Halls. I'd like to remind you what we typically do in terms of our agenda, just a little bit of virtual etiquette. I've got a few NS announcements. I'll talk about what's coming up next with our Space Forums and Town Halls, and then we're gonna get right into the program so you can enjoy it. As always with the virtual etiquette, I do encourage people to use uh, the Q&A function to submit uh, questions. That way, we're, that's the only thing we see is the Q&A, the, the questions. It's easier to pick them out uh, to, add, to ask to the speaker, but you're free to use the chat function as well. I just encourage everybody to be respectful of uh, our speakers and our audience uh, when you do that. And we do hope to also at the end, uh, open this up to any people who want to ask a question live. So feel free to submit questions as we go along. We did get quite a few questions that were submitted. We're going to try to cover them uh, all. What I'd like to do is give you a little bit of uh, a few announcements related to the National Space Society. So if you're enjoying our programming, like these space forums and town halls, I do encourage you to please donate to support the NSS. Uh, I will try to put a link into the chat function so you can see it, uh, but we encourage you to give to our cause. Uh, we are a, a volunteer-based organization. Uh, it's dedicated to a space-faring civilization, uh, and we really appreciate your membership and your support. A couple things that are coming up in, uh, in uh, November that you might want to be aware of. Uh, these are in LA. Both are at the Sheraton Gateway Hotel at Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, the first is the Space Settlement Summit. Uh, that's going to be Thursday and Friday, November 10th and 11th. And uh, those are it's a two-day summit uh, with a great panel of industry experts and subject matter experts. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to that website. Uh, and also at the same hotel, uh, on the Friday evening is the Dare to Dream Gala. It's about celebrating the new uh, space age. We've got uh, actors John Delancey from Q, Harry Hamlin, who's a member of our Board of Governors, uh, and also uh, Dr. Erin McDonald, who is the, tr the Star Trek lead science advisor and astrophysicist and playwright and director Joss Ravitch. So it's going to be a great event. This money uh, that we raise is used to actually support and fund kids who are not just you know, interested in space, but want to pursue, pursue that dream of space. So uh, also take a look at that website. And I believe you got today our downlink newsletter. There's more information about both of these events uh, in the newsletter. Also, just a reminder at the end to complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a couple of minutes uh, and it is anonymous and it really does help us in terms of planning future events. So we thank you for that as well in advance. What's coming up next? Uh, two weeks from tonight, we have a conversation with uh, space artist, uh, James Vaughn. Uh, that's gonna be moderated by Rod Pyle, the editor of Ad Astra Magazine. Uh, and uh, uh, James does quite a few of our images that are on our website on Ad Astra. So it's gonna be a really interesting conversation. Uh, two weeks after that, we have our students for the exploration and development of space. They're going to be coming live uh, from their Space Vision Conference uh, in Chicago. Do know we're going to do this an hour earlier to best accommodate them. Uh, that's going to be at 8 p.m., but we'll make sure you know about that. And then also coming up, uh, we do this every year, we end with the, the Space Year in Review with Larry Boyle and Jim Plaxico. So looking forward to uh, a great uh, few events as we close out the year with our space forums. Uh, now it is, uh, as we move into the program, it is my great 
that pleasure. And uh, oh, I should say one last thing. If you have any ideas for speakers, please let us know. Uh, we look forward to your ideas and any recommendations that you might have. Now, as we move into the program, it's my great honor uh, and privilege to introduce a very special guest uh, from the NSS. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Carlton Johnson, who is the uh, chairman of our National Space Society Board of Governors. Uh, Carlton is going to be doing a welcome and also introduce uh, our guest speaker for this evening. So I'm going to stop sharing so he can. Uh, there we go. Carlton, uh, please join us. Give us a welcome. Excellent. Thank you, Bert. And I want to thank everybody who's joining tonight. This is going to be an outstanding forum. And one of the things I want to tell you up front, if you haven't caught on, space really is cool. It's been cool for a very long time. And we are now living in an age where a lot of things that NSS has talked about for the last uh, several decades is finally coming true. And uh, today we have a great speaker who's going to be sharing some great stories with us. Uh, I, I'm a former Air Force guy, so I gotta give him a little bit of razz. Uh, you know, you see behind me the preferred uh, weapon of the United States Air Force, the F-16 Funny Falcon. Uh, I happen to be up in uh, Congress and we were doing a, a walk on the hill uh, advocating for uh, space programs. And I met this gentleman, uh, uh, Scott Altman. We just got to talking and, you know, typically when two military get, guys get together, you can always tell they have a military <laughs> bearing about them. So I went, so Scott, you, you kind of look like you've been around the block a bit. So were you military at this point? Very humble, by the way, very humble. Why, why, yes, I was very subtle, very calm. Oh, okay. So, so what did you do? Because, oh, I, I, I flew. And I'm like, oh, wow. So, what, what did you fly? You know, I was going to get on about maybe being an Air Force guy. Because so I was in the Navy, um, I flew F 14s. Now, secretly, I didn't tell Scott this, but I really wanted to join the Navy first. And that was the platform I wanted to fly. Oh, that's a story for another, yeah, story for another time. But I went, so F-14, so you probably seen that movie Top Gun. And he kind of got a little bit of a smile and goes, yeah, I've seen that movie. I go, so, you know, any of that, like really float your boat and stuff, you know, did you ever, you know, see any of the stuff that uh, happened in the movie? He goes, well, uh, yeah, I, I was actually kind of in the movie. And I'm like, you were in Top Gun? Like, <laughs> for real? And I thought he was pulling my leg. Yeah, because guys, that usually happens. And he goes, yeah, I was. I said, so, like, were you one of the backstop guys or something? He goes, well, you remember that scene where Mavic goes inverted and is giving the Meg the other message? He goes, I go, yeah. He goes, well, that was me. And I was like, dude, you're a great <laughs> Meg insulter. Oh, my gosh. And so I was so excited to meet meet him and we got to talk about a whole lot of stuff. But in addition to being the great Meg insulter, Scott is of course one of uh, America's finest having not only gone into space, but done a great many things in space that he's gonna be very excited to tell you all about. So without any further ado, I would like to present the great Meg insulter, the great <laughs> Captain Scott Scooter Altman. <laughs> Thank you, Carlton. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's funny because sometimes I think my finger is the most famous part of me uh, when people hear that story. But uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be with you all tonight and be able to answer some questions. One of my passions is talking about flying and space. So this is a perfect opportunity to do both. And uh, I already have looked at some of the questions. It's gonna be a great evening. So I won't say anything more till we get down to the nitty gritty talking about the details. But uh, thanks for that intro. Good memories. Very and good. I told you, he's very humble. So don't be humble about your questions. Over to, over to you, Bert. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great introduction, Carlton. And we're looking forward to a, a, a fun evening. So uh, so Scooter, we've got a, a quite a few questions. They were broken down into a couple of different areas. And I think we could probably start with the, your background. And so you're a member of the Apollo generation. How did Apollo influence your career choices? So uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting question because it was kind of in the background. 
one of the things I'll never forget is seeing the Apollo moon landings when Neil stepped on the surface of the moon. I had not quite had my 10th birthday, but I was living in Illinois, staying up late, watching the TV and getting to see that. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But I'll tell you, uh, even then, for most of the rest of my life, I put astronauts in a different category. I'm like, they're probably not real, you know, normal humans. It's some special class of person. And uh, I n never really dreamed that I'd be able to follow in their footsteps. Oh, very good. But uh, had you thought about flying at a young age as well? Well, that, that uh, hit me much earlier. I was three years old when I was watching this old TV show that was on reruns, and it was called Sky King. And uh, from out of the West comes Sky King, flying a, a twin-engine uh, little low-wing, uh, I think it was a, a Cessna. But uh, it was really, I turned to my parents and I said, I want to be a pilot. And uh, they were very supportive. They said, you know what, you can do anything you want as long as you, you know, work hard, do your best and don't give up. And uh, that's what it took to get through there because uh, there were some twists and turns along the way. How old were you? How old were you when you sold it? So uh, <laughs> by the time I soloed, I didn't quite have the money to try and take flying lessons. So I I ended up, well, that kind of goes back into how I wound up in the Navy, too, because I grew up in Illinois, uh, away from oceans, and I, I never really realized the Navy had airplanes. So I, uh, I wrote my congressman, and I finally got an appointment to the Air Force Academy. I thought, this is it. My dreams are all coming true. And then they uh, gave me sort of a pre-induction physical Everything was fine until they measured my sitting height. And they said, uh, Altman, you're too tall to be an Air Force pilot. I'm like, what? You know, I had no idea um, that that could happen to me. So I thought my dream was over. I uh, decided to be an engineer and work on airplanes. And when I was at school at University of Illinois, I got a postcard from the Navy asking me if I was interested in nuclear power. Uh, I checked the box and I said, no, but send me some pictures of airplanes. So, so they did. They sent me a book on naval aviation. I flipped them through it. And the sitting height was uh, like two inches more than what the Air Force had. So I signed up for that. And that's how the Navy saved me from a career in the Air Force. Sorry, Carlton. <laughs> No, that's great that you answered that because the, the, the next question was about how you chose Wings of Gold. So it was because of your height. Yeah, the Air Force said no, and I had to find another way to get to the sky. <laughs> then the other part that you asked me about, how old was I when I soloed? So I've now gotten into the program where I'm going to go. I don't know if you remember the other old movie, Officer and a Gentleman, where sure. Richard Gere goes off. Well, that was the school I was going to. And I thought, you know what, I better find out if I'm any good at flying before I go down and go through all that. So I took a course at school and uh, got all the way through soloing in a uh, beach sport and just uh, loved flying. I mean, I still get the same thrill that I got just when you're rolling down the runway and you pull back on the yoke and you feel the wheels leave the ground. It's just, oof, we're flying. That's such a great uh, experience. Fabulous. So you eventually became a, a naval aviator. You became an F-14 pilot. And I know in your bio, you mentioned that the F-14 was probably your favorite aircraft. But tell us a little bit about the aircraft and what made it special. Well, the F-14 is just an amazing airplane. To me, it was like a 59 Cadillac. It was big. It had all the options, two big tails in the back, and uh, just a dream. I loved flying it. Now, you, you had to be a pilot to fly it. It didn't fly it for you the way some of the uh, more modern airplanes do with the flight control systems. Back then, we didn't have a digital flight control system. It was really pilot in the loop, and you had to fly the plane, uh, which I thought was great because that's what I wanted, to be kind of a stick and rudder guy flying the vehicle. Um, it, it's an amazing. I mean, from flying the jets that I did in the training command, to then flying an airplane with an afterburner like that and two good size engines, 
getting that kick in the back when you're uh, accelerating, it's just uh, really exhilarating. One of my favorite things to do was actually go down to about 500 feet off the water, slow down to about 200 knots, and then plug in both afterburners, full zone five, and you're wham, 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 and you accelerate and right at about 0.9 Mach, pull six Gs into the vertical and just start going up like a rocket until uh, you, you top out at about 30,000 feet and pull over the top. You're like, wow, what an airplane. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the problem is I sometimes had to fly demos for people. And uh, one time the battle group admiral said, well, I want to get a ride in an F-14. So, okay, scooter will take you up. So he's in the back seat and I'm doing that. I'm like, okay, we're going to accelerate here and then I'm going to pull up. Everything's okay. So we're zipping along. And when I start to pull into the vertical, his head goes down and he's buried because the, he can't sit up because of the Jesus. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he remembered that 20 years later when I was at a, a, an event where he was actually the CNO of the whole Navy now. And he goes, I remember flying with him. And you know what those guys like to do to admirals? I'm like, sir, that was not, I was not trying to get you sick. <laughs> Great story. So you, you also, also flew these, the Super Tomcat. So how did that actually compare to the A's and B's? And, and I know that the F-110 engine was a, a lot better than the TF-30 engine. Yeah, uh, that's the first thing I thought when I flew those new engines. Uh, for the first time, I'm like, man, where have these engines been my whole life? Because it really made the Tomcat into the airplane that it was designed to be. The TF-30s were kind of a substitute that got stuck in when the development of the uh, engine that was planned for it didn't go as well. And we lived with them for a while, uh, you know, my first uh, tour. But uh, the F-110s were great. The only thing I missed is it had so much thrust that it off the aircraft carrier, you didn't take your cat shots in full burner. You just took them in mill power. That's not quite the same show as having two engines blowing out at uh, full afterburner like we did with the A's. But uh, the great thing about the D was not just the engines. It was also the systems. The radar was improved. The um, uh, displays were better. I spent a lot of time while I was working as a test pilot helping to design uh, the displays for doing weapons release that we eventually integrated into the airplane and uh, making it, and then being able to take it on its very first operational cruise uh, was pretty rewarding. Did they retire it too early? Well, you're talking to a Tomcat guy, yeah. so I will say yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we could have made an investment in the F-14 and kept it going. A lot of people will say, well, it was a maintenance hog. It took too many maintenance man hours to keep it in the air. And when I was maintenance officer, the thing that I thought drove that was we didn't have the parts. So when an airplane went down, I had to go over to one of my other airplanes and say, OK, take that box out of that one and put it in this one. And then eventually we'll get that one fixed and we'll be able to put a box back in that other plane but it doubles your maintenance time because you're robbing from one airplane to put in another instead of pulling a box out and putting a replacement in. So uh, I think that caused a lot of the maintenance uh, man hour numbers that people complained about. Right. So you're an operational pilot. You make the decision uh, and to choose the test pilot path. What, what led you that direction? Well, you know, I said I'd gone to school to study engineering and I, I got my degree in aero engineering and I thought, well, what's the next challenge that I could do now that I'm flying uh, fighters? And I thought, you know, test pilot might be kind of cool and it lines up with my background. So I applied for uh, test pilot school, got selected, got sent uh, to Monterey to get my master's and then out to Pax River uh, to start training as a test pilot, which I really enjoyed that part of my career. How, did it, how does being a test pilot differ from being an operational pilot? Well, you're, you're looking at things to sort of expand the envelope. I mean, uh, we didn't have new airplanes coming out that I was flying for the very first time, but we had things that we added to the F-14, like um, the, the engines. The, the F-14B had been pretty well wrung out by then, but we still 
did a few tests with that. We added a, a data link system to the F-14D, and then uh, we did a lot of weapons release testing where we expanded the envelope going out. Uh, there's a, a photo that they made into a poster of an F-14 in a 60 degree dive letting four 2000 pound bombs off at once. And uh, that was actually me in the poster uh, dropping those, uh, those big babies. So uh, yeah, that, and then because we were flying um, 2000 pound bombs, one of the concerns was, well, what if you can't get all the bombs off? You know, they hang up in the back and because of the way the F-14 was set up with two in front and two behind in the tunnel kind of underneath, uh, if the ones in back didn't come off, it really moved your center of gravity way aft and the plane could get uncontrollable. So we did a flight test where we figured out, well, how do we manage that? And the nice thing about having a swing wing airplane is you can change where the center of lift is by sweeping the wings aft. And we figured out that you could move the wings back a little bit to regain the same stability between the CG and the center left that you had originally, but it made your approach speed a little bit faster, but uh, there was a, an out to recover if you got in that situation without having to lose the airplane. Right, right, thanks for that. So Carlton mentioned something and a lot of questions uh, uh, came in related to that. Uh, so you're famous for being part of the original uh, Top Gun movie. And I've heard you talk about it. And could you just share about how that happened and how you came to be one of the main pilots? Well, the first thing, uh, we had just gotten back from cruise. But on that cruise, in December, we were in the Sea of Japan, and the ship had been sort of steaming into the wind, which drove it towards Vladivostok, which evidently the Russians got a little irritated at, because all of a sudden, they did a giant raid with badgers and bears uh, and backfires came out uh, sort of doing practice runs on the aircraft carrier, which meant we launched everybody. So we all took off and we're out there on cap stations getting involved with Russians. The next day, fighters came out and we had little miniature dog fights with these Russian airplanes, uh, which really was kind of the setup for the beginning of the movie Top Gun. So it worked out because we came back off a cruise. And once you get back from a long cruise, that was seven and a half months. Typically you're, you're not doing much with your airplanes right away. You have a little bit of a break. Paramount came to Miramar to make the movie. And our squadron was the squadron they picked to provide the F-14s and the pilots to do the filming for the movie. So we right place, right time. The skipper picked four people to fly in the movie that he thought he could trust because he knew we were getting kind of a license to steal with the movie guys. Uh, and uh, it, it all worked out. I, it was a blast, I'll tell you that. The flying was awesome. Um, we, we did a bunch of flying out of Fallon, Nevada for the ridges, the overland stuff. And they would put the camera guys up on top of a ridge and you could just foresight that ridge and blow over it about 10 feet. And you're going by at 450 knots, there's this big whoosh. Everything goes up in the air and all the chairs and stuff go down the hill about 40 feet and the cameramen are diving to the ground. And the director said, okay, you gotta stop doing that. You know, let's behave. So we, we, uh, we did and it all worked out. Oh, very good. I, I do remember seeing you talk and, and you said you were uh, able to do some things that you normally could not do <laughs> as a naval aviator. And one of those things was buzzing the tower. And I think you said you did it like nine times. So that, how fun was that? <laughs> it was, that was really fun. Yes, because you're right. I mean, like Tom Cruise says, oh, goose, it's time to buzz the tower. You could come back, you could say that and buzz the tower. But when you landed, a guy in a staff car would drive up and go, okay, give me those wings, rip. And uh, <laughs> you're going home because that's unacceptable. So there I was, they said, you know, we really, we need you to buzz the tower. Would that be okay? I'm like, yeah. They said, all right, <laughs> we want to make sure we get a good shot. So we need you, you to do it like nine times. Is that okay? Yeah. So uh, by the end, I thought I was getting pretty good at buzzing the tower. Although they told me after the first four passes, uh, the folks in the tower evacuated because they were getting too much uh, shaking from the airplane going by like that. <laughs> Does sound like fun. 
now a couple of people did ask did you ever fly with tom cruise <laughs> so we flew the actors for about a week uh i had uh anthony edwards in my back seat at one time and tom cruise at another time and the director came to me after that week and said hey we're not flying the actors anymore and i'm like well why not are we not hitting our, our points and he said no you guys are doing great but when i look at the dailies I can't use it in the movie. The guys all look kind of green. <laughs> so, and uh, and he was paying seventy six hundred dollars an hour for the F fourteen time. He was also paying twenty three dollars a day for the pilots. So you knew who the star of the show was. Twenty three dollars a day. <laughs> that, that was per diem for Fallon, Nevada. That's what I. That was my flight in Top Gun bonus. <laughs> That is funny. So uh, I know we've covered a lot about your Navy career and just a couple more questions before we start moving on to your astronaut career. But, uh, you know, you flew 40 different types of aircraft. Uh, you said, of course, your favorite was the F-14D, but any others that really uh, touched you that you really enjoyed? Uh, I got to fly the Mirage 3 in uh, Switzerland, which was a neat Delta wing fighter. I uh, enjoyed flying that. It was a lot. It was an interceptor, not really a dogfighter like the F-14, but a fun airplane. And then uh, uh, I talked to you before about flying. I almost got to fly the YF-23, but they canceled the uh, NATF program right as I was headed there. And I did get to fly the F-15 uh, SMTD. It was for short, short takeoff and landing maneuvering technology demonstrator, which was a really interesting airplane. And I flew out to Edwards Air Force Base. I was going to be the Navy guy to fly that. And uh, I show up and they're like, well, we're not going to be flying the airplane today. Uh, I had made arrangements to get a Fresnel lens, what you use to land on an aircraft carrier, brought down from China Lake to Edwards so we could fly practice Navy approaches in this airplane. Well, the Air Force guys, had gone out and practiced a Navy approach before I got there using the, the Fresno lens, which is a great tool that puts you on a three degree glide slope and the flight control system of this airplane was so good, you could fly a three very smoothly, but they flew it all the way to touchdown. And Navy airplanes don't bounce, but Air Force airplanes aren't built that way. So the F-15 hit like a Navy airplane would and bounced up in the air, but the auto derotate function of the flight control system put the nose down. So then it hit on the nose gear and bent it 45 degrees off. And they had to land the airplane out in the lake bed. And uh, I had to go back home and wait about six months until they got it fixed. And I could come back out for the evaluation, but uh, they didn't want me uh, flying the approach anywhere near the touchdown. <laughs> yes, I didn't want that to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Uh, last question related to flying, and this one has to be a record for how many people ask this question. Uh, there was a lot of Navy uh, video of the government released about these UFOs, or as I guess we call them now, UAPs. So our members wanted to know, did you ever see a UAP? Well, I don't know. I was in the wrong place, I guess. Uh, I have to admit, I don't remember seeing anything that I couldn't explain when I was flying. Uh, so I missed out on that. It looked, some of the videos I've seen look pretty impressive. Uh, I have no idea what's going on, but uh, never happened to me. I got that too when I'm on orbit. Did I ever see any aliens? And <laughs> one time I, I said, well, there was that one, but no, never mind. No, I didn't see it. And the NASA PAO guy came after. Don't ever do that again. You'll get all the conspiracy <laughs> people all wound up. So, so don't listen to that. I didn't say it. Nothing happened. Very good. <laughs> so you obviously were checking all the right boxes in order to think about the astronaut program, especially the being a, a, a pilot, you know, being an engineer, being a test pilot, and, a, and so on. When did you start thinking about the transition from the Navy to, uh, to NASA and the space program? Yeah, so my career basically was a series of stages and, you know, fighter pilot, then going to test pilot school. And it was at test pilot school that we took a field trip near the end of our time there. We went to Edwards Air Force Base and talked to those guys. 
But we also went to Johnson Space Center and they had a little reception where the Navy astronauts came out and talked to us and we had some briefings. And I'm like, wow, some of these guys had careers like I did before they got selected for NASA. And I'm like looking around, this is really cool because I had followed the space shuttle. It launched right as I, uh, the year I graduated from college with an aero engineering degree. I had a friend who joined IBM and moved to Houston and worked on the shuttle program. So I kind of had known about the shuttle, but it wasn't until I got to test pilot school in 1990 when we took this field trip that I realized there was potentially a path for me to do that. So the two things I realized were one, astronauts are actually real people, and two, I really wanted to do this. So uh, not too long after that, NASA put out a call for applications. I uh, wrote my stuff up, talked about what I sent it off. Uh, NASA actually asked me down for an interview, uh, which was, they had, a, at the time, they only had about 2,000 applications, and they selected about 100 people to interview. So I was in that group, uh, came down, interviewed, and the interview is basically a week-long physical where you get to see yourself from all kinds of angles, most of which you prefer you hadn't. <laughs> but, and then you spend 40 minutes talking to a committee who asks you questions, well, what have you done since you got out of high school? And you talk a little bit about your career and what challenges you've had. And then you go off and you wait to get the call on who they want to actually come down and be an astronaut. So I am actually uh, flying some test flights out at Miramar, uh, doing wing air refueling off the KC-10, had a, a pod that you could plug. And it was the day they were supposed to call, but I was out of position. So they said, okay, Scooter, call us um, at this time and we'll see, you know, we'll let you know what the results are. And what we had all discussed was, well, if, if Don Putty, who was the guy who was the head of the flight crew operations director, if he calls you, that means you're in. If you get a call from a regular other astronaut who's on the committee, that's how they let everybody down. So uh, I call in to NASA and they go, oh, yeah, Scott, oh, there's somebody here who really wants to talk to you. I'm like, okay, who's going to, and on the phone, hello, Scott, this is Don Putty. I'm like, I'm in. And they go, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but we didn't select you. I'm out. Like, <laughs> Joy to depression in a nanosecond. Oh, but uh I knew I wanted to do it. So when uh, the next call for applications came out, I applied. And then uh, that story ended up with a happier ending. So, yeah, I've heard a lot of astronauts talk about that, the persistence that it's it's uh, you didn't if you don't get it the first time, try again and maybe even try again and again. Right. And, and that to me, that's the kind of thing I learned when I first was getting started, when the Air Force told me, no, you know, it's not the fact that somebody says you can't do it, it's what do you do after that? How do you keep moving? Is there another way to get there? And uh, when NASA told me no, I'm like, hey, okay, I've been here before. Let's see, maybe the next time around, it'll, the answer will be different. And, uh, and the funny thing was, I submitted my application and then my squadron left on cruise. So I'm like, man, I'm out of position. I'm gonna miss the interviews, uh, maybe next time. So then we're in the, Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, actually. And we just had early satellite phones on the ship. And I'm in my stateroom and I get a call from the dude. I was like, hey, there's somebody on the phone for you from NASA and it's a girl. So come down here to the ready room and take this call. I'm like, wow. Because at the time, it was 5,000 guys on the ship. We get, didn't get to talk to women very often. So I'm running down. And it's Teresa Gomez from the NASA uh, Astronaut Selection Office. And she said, hey, Scott, we'd really like to have you back for an interview. Is there any chance you can get off the ship and come home uh, to come back to NASA to do this interview? I'm like, well, let me check. So I, I, my skipper was sitting in the ready room right over there. Hey, skipper, NASA's on the phone. They want me to come back for an interview. What do you think? Because let me check with CAG. But then they go, OK, you can go. So I'm like, all right, I'll be there hang up the next day we're about to go blue water ops which means we'd be too far away for me to get off the ship but fortunately it was right at the right time to get a helo into Bahrain and then I jumped on a British Airways airplane back to San Diego and I'm, I'm flying home and I realized huh nobody else on the ship but me talked to NASA they trusted me I should have pulled this a month ago 
Yeah, the Hessler wants me to come back. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> so your your STS one hundred nine and one twenty five colleague uh, Mike Massimino tells a, a just a, a riot story about uh, preparing for the eye exam and getting a lot of interesting advice about that because he was worried about passing that. Did you have any funny stories or experiences during that process? Well, mine wasn't the physical part, although I have to admit I was a colon criminal uh, where we, uh, you get this proctoed sigmoidoscopy, which is uh, kind of like a colonoscopy, but without any meds and a shorter tube, but they found a polyp. So they said, all right, you need to have it looked at and removed. Um, so I, I got a colonoscopy out of that. But the uh, the other thing I would say is that, you know, you're in this interview with the board for 40 minutes. And the first time I went through that, at the end of that interview, they said, all right, Scott, do you have any questions for us? And I was like, uh, no, I didn't have anything to say. So this the second time around, I thought, you know, that was probably not good. I should have had some question or something. So we got to the end and they, OK, anything else you want to talk about? I said, well, there is one thing. My grandmother in Illinois got confused and told all her girlfriends down at the hair salon that her grandson was coming to Houston to be an astronaut. So if you don't want to ruin the reputation of an 82 year old grandmother, please select me. <laughs> Every, everybody cracked up and I walked out of the room at that. So uh, a great way to a great way to end it. So you 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 complete your astronaut training and your your first flight was was that what you expected? Was flying in space that first time? Because I've heard a lot of different things from a lot of different astronauts about the experience the first time. Well, you know, you train a lot in the simulator and it's a full motion simulator that tilts you up on your back and goes forward and moves you around. So I'm thinking like, man, I am fully trained. I know exactly what it's, everything is gonna be like when I'm in the real vehicle. Uh, and then it's launch day and I'm out there and you're, you're sitting in the seats for a while and your brain starts to tell you, hey, this is, we're in the simulator again. This is just like being back in that. And as you, you start up the hydraulics, there's a clunk when the engine's moving, you're like, whoa, I don't remember that from the simulator. And then, uh, you know, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, T minus six, the shuttle main engines light up and you, and you feel, oh, that's a little more shaky. And you go for the twang and then it, T minus zero, boom, the two solid rocket boosters go up and the whole thing is shaking the right. I'm like, man, we are not in a simulator anymore. And this <laughs> is going somewhere. It was a, a, an amazing experience. But so I thought I was perfectly prepared, but the actual journey to space was much more intense than I ever imagined. Any trouble with adapting to the microgravity? Well, um, I will admit I got a shot of Fenergan once I got up there. I mean, your inner ear and your brain is an amazing instrument and it's very finely attuned to life on earth and gravity. And you get into space and you turn your head and it's like, whoa, I don't understand those signals. That's bizarre. Uh, but I got a shot and about four hours later, I was able to float upside down and do all my stupid astronaut tip tricks. And I felt great the rest of the flight. Um, some people had a little more trouble adapting, but, uh, um, and the other thing I noticed is when I went back up on later flights, your brain kind of remembers and, uh, and gets you ready. So it's easier the second and third right. and fourth time. Right. Well, you commanded two Hubble repair missions. Can you tell us a little about those? I, I was very thrilled to go to Hubble and work those repair missions. Uh, that was my first commander flight was STS-109, and that was pretty challenging. We were doing things that hadn't really been planned, you know, removing the power control unit, basically open heart surgery on Hubble, uh, taking it out and putting the new one in and then hooking everything up. Uh, I had a very experienced crew. It was all, a little bit intimidating flying with so many people who had flown more than I had, but I was still the commander trying to, to run things and be in charge of stuff. Uh, but that mission went well, we got everything done. And then, you know, I went into sort of a parking lot when we came back from that, of course, we lost, uh, we lost Columbia on its next flight, STS-107. 
which to be honest with you, you know, 109 was designed to go after 107, mm -hmm. but because Hubble was having problems uh, with some of its system, they said, no, we need you to go first and Rick will go second with his crew. So he flew in my space and that accident, you know, should have happened on my watch instead of his. So I, I and he was a classmate. Two others were classmates of mine. That made a big impact on me. But uh, uh, so as a result of the Columbia accident, uh, Sean O'Keefe canceled the next Hubble servicing mission. And I, I really believed in Hubble and what we were doing with it. And so I was very happy when they put it back on. And also uh, when they did do that, NASA leadership decided they wanted somebody experienced to be the commander of that flight. And I got selected for that. And I really felt honored by that and, and humbled to some extent because it's a lot of responsibility riding on that repair mission. Um, and the whole concern about what do you do if something happens and we don't have a safe haven like space station to go to. Uh, it's too bad it's not as easy as it was in the movie Gravity to go from the Hubble <laughs> to station in, with a backpack on. I mean, you can't do that with a manned maneuvering unit. You can't do that even in a space shuttle. Uh, we've never built anything that could make that kind of orbital thing. But in the movie, it was like we have a big parking lot up there where you can go, hey, let's picnic over here with this station. Go Anyway, uh, when I saw Warner Brothers had me uh, watch the movie early, and I said, well, you know, you did some things really well. There is kind of a small technical problem with the capability of what is going on here. But on the other hand, it would have been a pretty short movie <laughs> if you kept the physics real. So uh, I thought they did a nice job. But uh, anyway, uh, 125, before we launched, um, Charlie Bolden was actually on our independent review team. And he came to me and he said, Scooter, you got to be able to accept failure because you have too much on your plate for this mission. We're asking too much of you and your crew, and there's no way you can get everything done. So just be ready to deal with that. Have a mental outlook that says, okay, we'll do the best that we can. Uh, so when we got to the end of that mission, after several days where things went wrong, and I'm like, oh man, I'm going to be remembered as the commander of the crew that killed this Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Somehow we got everything done and we set Hubble adrift again on its uh, journey of discovery. And I was so proud of the whole team on the ground and on the, the shuttle that got it done. Oh, very good. Uh, there were a couple other questions that talked about the, you know, what it means to have gone to space. And so, you know, did your experience flying in space change your outlook on humanity? I have to admit that it did for me. Um, and part of it's one of the big things for me, at least, is when I first got to orbit on that very first mission and you look at the horizon line and you see this almost infinitesimal tiny blue line right at the horizon. And I'm like, well, what, what is that? And so, well, that's the thickness of the atmosphere you're looking at. And it just looks so thin and fragile compared to the size of the earth. I'm like, wow. That's it. That's everything we have that makes us breathe and, and able to protect it from radiation. I just had an impression of the planet as a lot more fragile than I ever really thought of it as. And then uh, on the last mission, we're flying over Africa at night and I look down and I see a thunderstorm on one side of the continent and it pops off and a little thong of lightning goes over here and another pop goes off. And you just feel this rhythm, almost like the planet is sort of breathing underneath you as I'm watching it. You're like, wow, this is an incredible place. So many beautiful sights when you look back at the Earth from orbit. Uh, it gave me a real appreciation for the spaceship Earth that we're sailing on right now. Very good. I saw a question that was submitted and also a question that came in with the people who registered about the skill sets of a fighter pilot and a test pilot and how that carries over to your tasks as an astronaut. Can you comment on that? Uh, the biggest thing I think is the discipline in attacking a problem. When you're going to do a test flight or look at something, you say, okay, what, what are we trying to do? Understand what the goal is. 
what are the steps? Let's talk about how to do that safely and come up with a plan, you know, brief the plan and uh, fly the brief, you know, do, do what you said you're going to do. And flying in space is a lot like that. You say, okay, these are the things we want to get done. What's the best way to do them? How do we work together? How do we back each other up? That's one of the big things about flying in space is trying to do things as a crew. Say, well, okay, we had a failure here. I, I think this is the switch to throw, but I'm not gonna throw that switch until somebody agrees with me that we're doing the right thing here. And that my hand is where I think it is before I throw that switch. Uh, and that's one of the things, it's not always being the fastest, but it's, it's making sure you're right uh, when you do things. And I think training as a fighter pilot helped me with that. And the, the other thing, you know, flying fighters is a huge mental game. When you're leading a division of four fighters, say, and you, you have bogeys out there, opponent raider, how do you deploy your forces? Uh, what's the next? Thing? And then when you're in a dog fight with somebody, okay, how do I use my airplane to its best advantage? Should I go vertical now? and you have this mental chess game going on in space, there's not an adversary out there, but space is kind of an adversary. And you know that if you give it the upper hand, you know, bad things could happen. When guys go out to do spacewalks, making sure um, that we take care of their suits, that their tethers are lined up and that no one goes floating off. And as the commander, I felt like I was trying to manage that help um, at times making calls, okay, we're gonna come in now, or uh, I made a call at one point, hey, we're gonna try and do a couple more things. Don't worry, we won't leave you out there too long. Uh, we're gonna take care of you and good luck uh, finishing up. Were there any scary moments? Well, uh, there, were, there was a master alarm right at liftoff on my last shuttle flight, which is the first time that had happened to me. Uh, we lost one of our flight control channels, uh, but the ground, so we said, okay, uh, no action. And so, okay, we lost one, but we're good. So then uh, later on, we lost, we, well, we didn't lose. We saw a degradation in this helium pressure transducer and it was failing slowly. And it's the same signature you would get in the simulator when you're about to lose an engine. But we didn't have any of the other uh, corollaries. But so I'm just saying, okay, let's always prepare for the next worst thing. And so I said oh, to my pilot, okay, Ray J, I see the DPTT. If we lose the engine, we're in the RTLS abort window, and that's what we'll execute. So we kind of briefed the plan so we're ready to go. You know, that didn't happen. Now, the RTLS, for folks who don't know, is a maneuver where the shuttle is flying away from the pad till it gets to about Mach 5, then it flips around and flies backwards to its own plume until it slows down enough and starts coming back towards the field. Because you're trying to get rid of all the fuel in the external tank. And then you punch the tank off. And it, if it doesn't have enough fuel in it, it won't slosh and come back and hit the shuttle. And there's a nine out of 10 chance that it, everything will be fine. But one out of 10 is not great odds. So we just, RTLS, okay, we blow through that, we get to orbit. And one of my mission specialists comes up to the cockpit and says, Scooter, that RTLS discussion ruined my enjoyment of the launch experience because he was all <laughs> hyper about doing that maneuver. <laughs> one last question before we, we move on. I know we're getting a number of questions that are submitted and I want to make sure we can get to them as well. But uh, it, the Hubble's been back in the news again. Uh, there's this SpaceX, talk about SpaceX, uh, uh, doing a, a mission to boost the Hubble Space Telescope. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm thrilled that we have Hubble and James Webb at the same time. I think they're both incredible instruments. It's amazing. You know, back in 2009, when we did our Hubble repair, it seemed like things were failing left and right on the telescope. You know, just during the time we were training to fly, we lost three different pieces of the uh, telescope failed, and we had to fix them. Since then, it's been remarkably sturdy, which is amazing to me. And I do know that Hubble is, you know, the orbit is decaying. Eventually it's gonna fall out of orbit. 
And you would like to have a controlled deorbit when that happens, so nobody gets hurt because there's a lot of big pieces on it. Uh, or park it and see if we could do something with it later on. It is an incredible instrument. Originally, we had planned on uh, flying a shuttle to it and bringing it home, but I think that went by the wayside after the, uh, I think it was a Challenger accident that changed their thoughts on that. But uh, I, I would love to go back to Hubble and either repair it or boost it or whatever we decide. Great. So you've had a great NASA career for space flights. Uh, what led you to the decision to retire from NASA and the Navy and move into the private sector? You know, when I was flying as an astronaut, uh, I struggled with that a lot. How am I gonna know it's time to hang it up? When, how will I make that decision? And I, I looked around and said, well, I want to have something that I thought was really better than what I was doing to go to and pull me into. Uh, however, NASA took care of that for me in 2010 when they said, hey, we are retiring the space shuttle. And uh, the astronaut office said, okay, we're getting rid of the space shuttle. There are no more opportunities for you to fly scooter. So the only thing we'll be flying for a while is astronauts on Soyuz to the space station. And Scooter, you have a tall sitting height. We <laughs> tested you in a Soyuz and you don't fit. So we're taking you off the space flight assignable list, which meant I was not gonna be able to even fly the T-38 anymore. And I was like, well, if I'm not flying, I, I think I have to go. So um, NASA helped make the decision for me by kicking me out of the cockpit of the T-38 and not having something big enough for me to, to fly in. I did spend my last year after Hubble working as the lead for the exploration office for the astronaut office and helping work on the design of the crew exploration vehicle, which is now called Orion. And one of the things I said as I was going out the door is keep working on this vehicle and make sure that it continues to be sized for normal people like me. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Was it was it difficult to make the adjustment when you uh, you know you like you said when you went to the that first visit to Johnson Space Center you said wow so you had all this experience and and uh, it's like what do you do for an encore? Yeah, well that's a good point. But what I found is uh, I spent a lot of time as I was thinking about leaving. I called other astronauts who had left and gone on to things, asked them for their advice, uh, what to look at. I had met. A couple of companies because at Goddard, while we were doing the, all the Hubble planning and training, we spent a lot of time at Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, one astronaut advised me and said, Hey, look around, talk to the big companies, but don't turn your nose up at the smaller companies, too. There's a lot of opportunity there as well. Uh, so it, it was an interesting time in my life because my whole career. I'd always known what the next thing I wanted to do was, you know, okay, I want to go to test pilot school. All right. Now I want to, you know, work as a test pilot, fly the F-14D. And now I want to go to NASA and be a NASA astronaut. Now I want to be a com shuttle commander and fly those. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, I don't really know what I want to be now, but uh, some folks talked to me and uh, I had a couple of offers from industry and I picked ASRC federal because one of the guys that I'd worked on on both my Hubble flights recommended them to me. And I had an opportunity to continue to work in the space business and, and it's worked out really well. I've been there 12 years now. Uh, but the, the other thing I noticed is, you know, each step on my career was a different challenge. There's a challenge when you go to industry. Uh, there's a whole new vocabulary that I wasn't used to speaking as an astronaut, things that are important uh, to folks in the business world. When they say P&L, they don't mean payload, like I always thought. They mean something else, and you don't want to screw that up. So uh, it was an education, and the company was very patient with me while I, I got my feet on the ground, started understanding what we were doing, and I kind of had the opportunity to move up through the ranks, and now I'm the president of the Space Operating Group at ASRC Federal. What are some of the things you're doing in that role? Well, one of my favorite things is that we have about 800 people in the Florida area who support the space program there. Uh, some folks on a Kennedy infrastructure communications contract, 
a decent sized group on this uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station doing the launch operations support. And then we're up to about 300 people supporting Lockheed Martin as technicians and engineers who are actually assembling the Orion vehicle in the operations and checkout building there at KSC. So when Artemis launches next month, it's gonna be pretty exciting to see a vehicle that I have continued to be involved with since the beginning back in, I think it was 2004, when we started doing the requirements and working on that, to now see it fly uh, on a mission to the moon. And then right after that, we're getting Artemis II ready to go. Our folks are in the ONC putting that vehicle together right now. I stopped in there a week ago and got to go in the clean room and see it. Uh, so it, it's inspirational for me to feel like I still have my finger in it a little bit working with things. Absolutely. Uh, I, there was a question that was submitted about Orion. Can you tell us more about how Orion was constructed and why it's the safest vehicle to carry astronauts back to the moon? Well, so a lot of people say, well, why didn't we take the shuttle to the moon or why, why do we have to switch to a capsule again? And part of it's the physics of going to the moon didn't change. Now, one of the things I saw as I was part of the design team as we were looking at Orion, we looked back at Apollo. The uh, outer mold line of Orion is basically the same as Apollo, just expanded, a bigger, bigger capsule. And the thing I looked as we analyzed uh, Apollo is how great a job those engineers did, you know, putting it right down the center of the corridor and many different things, you know, CG performance uh, of the capsule. Pretty great. And having a proven shape like that was something to build on. Um, and the other thing that makes Orion safer, well, there's two things I think that contribute to that. One, when you're on the pad, there is a uh, launch abort tower that will get you out of dodge if something bad happens, either sitting on the pad or when you're at max Q going uphill, it can separate you from a bad day and you'll get back to the ground in good shape. The other thing, is it unlike the shuttle, which had the leading edge exposed during liftoff and ascent, uh, the recovery system, the thermal protection system is all covered at launch and uh, shielded from having anything happen to it until you actually separate from the service module. So even MMOD, micrometeor uh, debris impact, is not as big of a threat as it would have been if you had an exposed heat shield through your whole mission. So that and the fact, the other part is a capsule coming back at lunar return um, speeds will survive versus a winged vehicle, which would, I think, take too much heat uh, to, to come back in one piece. Right. Follow-up question related to the SLS itself. Do you think the current NASA Artemis program can be successful uh, based on the long lead times related to the SLS vehicle? It's a challenge that uh, I know the program is really working hard to solve. Um, we need to fly, you know, on a regular basis. It'd be nice to fly once a year at a minimum rhythm just to keep things going. You look at what Apollo did. Uh, how they flew more frequently than that, but they had a bigger budget if you, when you look at things, the share of the national gross product. But uh, I think we can get the cost down, we can do things better. Um, and it's just such a great capability. I mean, it sets the stage for us to be able to do really incredible things in space, uh, establish a presence at the moon, understand what it takes to live and work further away from the earth and set the stage for going to Mars, which I think is the real goal, to go to another planet and learn how to do that. We're using the space station to learn a lot about how to live for long periods of time in zero G and the astronauts there are working out and being in shape. Because the last thing I would want if I, I flew to Mars would be land on the surface and then realize in the Mars gravity, I can't get up because I'm out of shape from a six month ride uh, to the to Mars. So I, I think we're setting this, I mean, it's an exciting time. I used to talk to groups and say, you know, there's some great things just over the horizon. Pretty soon we're gonna be able to fly Americans from America again. Pretty soon we're gonna have vehicles that uh, take astronauts back to the moon. 
And now we're there. It's happening. We have the vehicles. We're flying astronauts. SpaceX is flying. You know, Boeing Starliner is going to come online pretty soon. And then Artemis and Orion are going to have astronauts journeying back to the surface of the moon. And I couldn't be more excited. There's a lot going on with uh, I, I don't know if we call them private astronauts, but you know, you had Inspiration Four, uh, you had uh, you know the Axiom flights, uh, and uh, there's Pol Polaris Dawn coming up. How do you see uh, the evolution of uh, you know of NASA astronauts versus the uh, I'll call them the private astronauts? Well, I think it's a positive sign that we can move that way as a species, I guess, that we could expand the envelope for who can do what. In some ways, reminds me of the beginning of aviation when the first guys who flew were like, oh, that nut is going out in that uh, thing and he's going to fly. Half of them killed themselves doing things. Uh, we're now expanding the envelope and saying, okay, more people can do that. Uh, there's still, you know, it's still a hard thing to do to take a mass sitting on the surface of the earth and accelerate it to 25 times the speed of sound. That's a lot of energy. It's a lot of difficulty, but it can be done. And we're showing that it can be done and we can expand the number of people who can go. I, I think the whole uh, Blue Origin thing, flying people up, I know it's a 10 minute flight, but it's an exposure to seeing the earth from a different perspective that you can get a lot more readily than uh, you know trying to fly to orbit. And I think that's a positive for us. To, to, and the level of interest that I get when I talk to people, hey, what about this? You know, could I do that at some point? Still kind of expensive, but, you know, if it gets cheaper and cheaper, there'll be more of that. And I think that'll be a big positive as we get better at doing that, driving down the cost. It's a win for a lot of things. You know, being able to put satellites on orbit when we need them, especially if there's a little satellite war going on in orbit between us and China. You'd want to be able to refurbish them and put them back up or maneuver them around. So I hope that doesn't happen, but it'd be good to have the capability just in case. Right. One last question before I open it up to some of the questions that we got from our live audience. And then I've got a couple that we'll close with, but how do you see the, the whether it's the partnership or the collaboration between commercial space and NASA evolving as we move forward? Well, I think NASA needs to be uh, open and we, we have been, I know I was part of the effort to begin the uh, commercial crew efforts way back in 2005, but, and NASA has helped uh, SpaceX move along by providing expertise and some financial support. I think that cooperation should continue. Now, there may be a case, and we're seeing that with the Starship, where NASA said, all right, uh, Elon, build us the lander for the moon, and we'll use your technology to do that. Um, so that cooperation, that exchange, I think having the access to NASA expertise helped the private space companies uh, develop successfully, and hopefully NASA will be able to use some of that capability to fund, to support the missions that we do in the future. Great. So let me open it up to some questions that have submitted, or have been submitted. Uh, I know it looks like Carl, who asks a lot of questions that many of our space forums have, has quite a few. Uh, I think most of those you've already touched on, but uh, here's one about the skills necessary to become a test pilot. Well, uh, there is some stick and rudder capability still, I think, even in today's airplanes, you have to be able to be a, a decent pilot, but also having a level head, being able to, to look at things, analyze them, and come up with a plan to deal with whatever is happening. Uh, that approach, methodical problem solver, uh, that's what you want to have. I mean, that was even back in Chuck Yeager's day when he was flying the X-1. He looked at things that way, figured out how to handle the vehicle in uh, situations like that. And I think that head work is maybe even more important than the physical part of flying, that you can mentally look at things, break them down, decide what to do. 
not overreact, no panic, but uh, methodically go through your procedures till you get uh, everything under control or taken care of. Kind of a related question in a, in a way, did you find that being a, a, a test pilot or a shuttle astronaut was more challenging? Uh, you know, in some ways, I would say a test pilot was more challenging, but that's not really a fair statement because of the difference when I was at NASA, where I felt like I always had a team that was there to work with me. And if there were challenges, they were going to help me overcome them. And we would work together to figure out the right way to approach things. Sometimes as a test pilot, I felt that it was more up to me especially when I was learning to fly and we were being graded, it was like, okay, you either pass or you don't, and that's on you. At NASA, it was like, we want you to be successful. You either demonstrate your ability to be successful or we'll work with you until you can demonstrate that. And there was a more collaborative uh, environment there than I'd seen uh, in, in my career prior to that. So that's what helped make things pseudo easier, even though the tasks were really still pretty difficult. Uh, a question from uh, Gilberto wants to know the the difference between the, the I guess the mission special mission specialist astronauts because I they're still using some of that terminology today versus a pilot astronaut. Yeah, it's funny because I think that has uh, almost completely changed from what it was when you were flying a space shuttle. Uh, hopefully, people recognize that the shuttle was actually hand flown to landing. So that's why we thought, hey, we should really have test pilots there because they actually have to fly the vehicle and bring it in. Uh, you know, it's a glider. You burn your engine 12,000 miles away from touchdown. And the one thing you know from that point is we're going to hit the ground and you would like to have a runway underneath you when that happens. Uh, but now with the capsules that they're flying, you, you know, SpaceX, you're really more of an operator than a pilot. And I would say that's what our mission specialists were. They were the people who had a variety of backgrounds, uh, all sorts of different capabilities. And uh, <coughs> they would, uh, you know, we had doctors, we had uh, engineers, scientists. I flew with a veterinarian twice, Rick Linehan. Uh, so they had a wider range. The pilots were mostly navy and air force guys who had a test pilot background uh, because the shuttle had to be flown one question that came in uh, on both the chat and the q a has to do with the web space telescope are you aware of any uh efforts that could be done if the web space telescope needed repairs well nasa made a decision uh, a long time ago that they said we are going to be success oriented for the james webb uh, and they didn't want any Hubble-like uh, errors to show up. And, I'm, and it's amazing, because when you look at the James Webb and the or, origami project that it was folded up to be inside the Ariane 5 launch vehicle, and then there's like 117 individual miracles that had to happen for it all to be, it all worked. Uh, it's a true, true engineering achievement. I'm so proud of that team for what they achieved. Uh, interestingly enough, they were getting ready to launch the James Webb and the crew at the Johns Hopkins Space Science uh, te Space Telescope Science Institute were a little nervous. They said, OK, Scooter, come talk to the team because you've got experience, you know, with high pressure launch events. So I, I talked to them for a little bit about what we'd gone through and how, you know, they had done all their homework. And I said, you know, you guys got this. It's all going to be all right. Just, you know. Pay attention, follow your procedures, do what you need to do, and uh, I bet everything works out. And I'm so happy that it did. Very good. Yes, I, I just an aside. I had a chance to see it in the uh, uh, in the White Room and assembly uh, at uh, Space Park, uh, north of Space Park in Redondo Beach. Uh, Oh. Uh, I was visiting my friend there and he took me in to see, you know, from the observation deck. So, so pretty cool to say, Hey, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Cause it, it's out where nobody's going to see it again. Right. Uh, actually question from Carlton. Uh, you've had many experiences on land, sea, air, and space out of all those experiences. What accomplishment are you most proud of? And what is the most important lesson you want to share with the audience today? 
Well, I, you know, I look at the things, and I'm very proud of the stuff that I did with the Navy and with NASA. Uh, but I have to tell you, I'm most proud of the fact that I have three sons who graduated from college and are all successful, having happy lives. And to me, that's probably my biggest achievement. Fabulous. Uh, we do have an accolade here from James says, uh, what a great adventure you've had. The Air Force should have changed the height limit just for you. Uh, what an exceptional person they missed out on. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So a little more on that height story. Uh, when I first came into the Navy, they went through a whole thing where they had me sit down and they measured me and they wrote down all these codes. But the young corpsman who was doing that made mistakes and made it look like I was a lot shorter than I actually was. So, okay, I'm going through the training command and I'm almost ready to get my wings in A4s when a flight surgeon looks at my file and is like, wait, this is all wrong. You, you need to be remeasured and we need to check you out in the A4 and see if you really fit. And then they said, well, you actually don't fit. And uh, so I, but I'm like, hey, I'm about done. Come on, let me get my wings and go on. So uh, they did, which I appreciated, but they gave me a letter that said, all right, due to your sitting height, you cannot fly all these airplanes. And an A7 was one of them. And there were a few others. Uh, which I have to admit at some point in my career, I wound up flying all of them. Uh, so don't tell the flight surgeons I got away with it. Uh, Jerry wants to know how tall you are. If you want to, if you're ready to share. <laughs> so, I'm six foot four, which is the maximum height for an astronaut. My sitting height is the long part. So I have a long torso, but uh, my boss from the astronaut office, uh, used to call me WLA for world's largest astronaut because I was 6'4", the maximum height, and I was actually a bigger guy, a little bit heavier. Uh, and the seat of the uh, space shuttle had to be recertified because it no longer had a 20 G crash limit with me in it, with all my survival gear on it. It was like a 19 G. And I was like, well, if that's the difference between me making it or not, I'm okay with that. I'll live with a 19 G seat. Right, very good. Uh, let me just see uh, a lot of the questions that were in Q&A you've answered already. I just want to see if anyone wants to ask a question live. Uh, just raise your hand because I've got a few more to close just about uh, out of time. So if anyone wants to ask, we'll give you that opportunity. I'll turn on your microphone. Let's see. Or is there, we're, we're sh they're shy tonight. <laughs> So uh, let me get a few a few other questions in and we'll see if anything else uh, comes up on that. Uh, any view of these, uh, the billionaire space tourists? How do you feel about them? <laughs> I'm glad they're putting money into space. That's uh, probably one of my, my big things. Uh, and like I said, I'm glad to see more people exposed to space flight. I think it's a positive for us. And as we start to lower that bar, getting more people to be able to be exposed to it, I mean, it's going to take an awful lot to get us on living on Mars, which I think is the future of humanity to extend our reach beyond just one planet. John Young, you know, a guy who walked on the moon, used to be in the office with me and he said, you know what, single planet species don't survive long term. And you look at the record of the dinosaurs here on Earth. So I'm thinking, yeah, it would be good for us to put humanity on other planets. Uh, our ability to travel long distances is pretty limited right now. So I'm waiting for that 12 year old who doesn't pay attention in physics and figures out, oh, warp drive would work like this. So good luck. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, let's see. We, we do have a hand raised. I see. Let me just make sure I can access it. Let's see. Okay. It's a uh, R.A. Rosenstein. R.A., I'm going to allow you to talk and ask your question. Okay, you're going to have to turn off uh, your muting. There you go. You can ask your question. Well, some of this question may have been covered before, but I'm interested in the, the relative emphasis we should put on the space explorations, exploration of selling other planets compared to the uh, scientific investigations of the cosmos. How do we juxtapose those two qualities 
And can we bring them more in sync as we go forward? Well, I, I think that's the key point, keeping those two efforts in sync. Now, you can do an awful lot with robotic exploration. We did have a, a planetary geologist come to the astronaut office one time, and he said, you know, having a rover on Mars is great, but if I had boots on the ground, in 45 minutes, I could do everything that they've done with the rover in like two years. Just because having a human in the loop adds that value and the ability to think on your feet and analyze situation. But you know, you can't do it all with one and not the other. I think so that I like your idea about coordinating that, keeping those efforts in sync. We do learn a lot about the whole universe, just you know, the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb. Uh, space telescope are both really time machines that show us the universe billions of years ago, millions of years ago, depending on where we pointed and how long the light's been traveling to get to us. And to me, that is the first step of space exploration is pulling that in, looking at the images of the galaxies, and then figuring out where we can go. And hopefully humans come along uh, behind. Very good. A uh, question came in from uh, Vanessa uh, that she said, tell us about the overview effect. The overview effect? Like, That's what it is, the overview effect. I am not sure what that is either. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to ask the question so we can, uh, you can, we can turn your mic on? Let me do that. I'll give, now I'm going to let you talk. And just turn off your muting and you can ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I we can. can. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Your your true inspiration. Uh, you really belong to the group of people who have advanced humanity. And thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. Um, I just wanted to, for you to inspire us a little and talk to us a little bit about the overview effect to, to tell us what the earth looked like. Ah. Um, you did kind of touch on the topic, but uh, what it is that you felt and how it, you feel like it changed you and whether uh, you kind of feel like you lost that now or whether you, you still um, remember that time a bit. Thank you. Uh, some of those, those memories, uh, yeah, great question, are burned into my mind that uh, I'll never forget. And that connection. Um, on my very first space flight, uh, we were flying a 39 degree inclination orbit, which meant it took me over the central part of Illinois. And every time our orbit took us over that part, because that's where I was born and grew up, I would look down to see if I could see the ground. And for the first 14 days of the mission, every time we came over Illinois uh, in the day, the vehicle was either in the wrong attitude, so I couldn't see the ground, or I could see the ground, but it was totally socked in with cloud cover, and I couldn't see any details on the ground. Then on flight day 15, the day before we were to land, I come floating up to the cockpit. I look on world map and it says, hey, we're coming up on St. Louis, and we're going to arc around uh, just over my hometown. So I, I look at that on the map. I go and look out the window, and it's clear. I could see St. Louis. I picked out the Illinois River. And as we're flying along, I trace it up until I see the Peoria Airport across the river and the city of Pekin right there on the river. And that is where I grew up, where everybody who loved me and helped me and got me to the point where I could be there. And I just felt an incredible emotional connection with the planet, with the earth, and how much it supported me to be there and to be able to look down and see my hometown. And it's a, a connection. I mean, I can see I still get emotional just talking about it. And then I tried to grab a camera and get some pictures of it because you're flying over the earth pretty fast. You don't have too long to dawdle before you're, you're past it. And you can't see it anymore. But uh, the earth is an incredible planet. Uh, I did get asked the other day, was I sure it wasn't flat? <laughs> and I can tell you, yes, I am very sure it is not a flat earth. It's round, and we went around it a lot of times. Very good. 
uh, we're about five minutes over, Scooter. So I want to I want to close out, and you, we appreciate your generosity of time here. So two two final questions, and uh, a couple of the questions that had come in about uh, did you you know did you want to go to the moon or to Mars? But I'll ask one that's closer to Earth. Uh, you know, Michael Lopez uh, Alegria flew on a, a commanded AX one. Peggy Whitman Whits. Peggy Whitson is going to be commanding AX2. Uh, if they come to you and say, hey, uh, Scooter, we, we'd like you to go up again. Are you ready? <laughs> I think I, I might be ready. Yeah, I don't know. I have to ask my uh, current boss about that and then my wife. But uh, uh, <laughs> I loved the movie Space Cowboys where the old guys got to come back and save the day. And uh, I would love to do that. The Hubble servicing mission would be an incredible adventure. Very good. Great. Well, we'll make, we'll put a good word in for you then. <laughs> Please. So, very good. So final question then, uh, any advice for the next generation that might want to work in the space industry or even fly into space? So uh, yeah, the same thing that I think my parents told me when I told them I wanted to be a pilot, you know, that's my, my overall advice, you know, work hard, look around, learn as much as you can and find that area that you really resonate with that you're interested in because when you're excited about learning something it's easy to try and become the best that you can and that's always the kind of people nasa will be looking for and even if nasa doesn't pick you up you're working in something that resonates with you and you're excited about it. you know so do your best learn as much as you can and then when you have a goal don't give up when people say no maybe there's another way. Look around for options. Maybe you change things a little bit, but you still get to, to try and do as much as you can. A great way to end tonight. So thank you so much, Scooter. We really enjoyed the conversation and you shared quite a bit about your career and experiences and we thank you so much. I want to see if Carlton has uh, any final comments before we close out, Carlton? Oh, I'd say, are you, uh, no, nope, not on mute. Oh, can you hear oh, me? Oh, there you are. Perfect. There you yeah. It's good. I just want to say, you know, first of all, thanks a lot for taking the time to share these remarkable insights. And uh, I, we're both airmen uh, uh, from a different past. So uh, by the non-power vested of me, I am granting you a unofficial Air Force uh, commission and I'm going to share some wings with you. And when I see you next time, uh, I have a good old Air Force coin because yeah, uh, we, we missed a good one, but yeah, you know, we all won by having you in the service and in space. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for some great words tonight, my friend. Well, thank you very much, Carl. And I really enjoyed uh, uh, our time together and especially tonight as well. So thank you, that means a lot. Well, very right, back good. to you, Bert. Thanks so much, Carlton. And again, Scooter, thank you so much. Uh, it was just fabulous. I really appreciate it. Uh, I always like to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Fred Becker, for all his support on the technology side here for our webinar. And of course, my colleague, Larry Ahern, uh, who helps be organize these space forums and town halls. So, so thank you so much. What I want to do, everybody, is just share my screen one last time as we close out for tonight. Uh, and uh, it's okay. So I actually had a slide here for you. And uh, I had that slide, of, that picture of you, uh, Scooter, when you were visiting the Intrepid. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah. So again, thank you so much uh, for everybody who joined us. I know we had guests tonight from Australia and from India. Uh, so again, thank you. So for those in our current time zone, uh, wishing you a great evening. Uh, for those into our next, the next time zones, the next day, have a great day ahead and, of course, a great weekend. Stay safe. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks for a great conversation uh, with uh, James Vaughn and Rod Pyle. So everybody, uh, again, saying thank you for joining us. We really appreciate all you do to support NSS and our mission as a spacefaring, to make a, a spacefaring civilization. So everybody, take care. And I'm just going to say good night and thank you. Scooter, thank you again. Fabulous. Great, great evening. Take care, everybody. Hey, take care. Scooter. Hi,